Welcome to one of the most fabled and mysterious places on Earth. The world's oldest continuous civilization. China, today, is a vision of the future. It has the fastest growing economy on Earth, symbolized by architectural wonders and technological advances. Along a closed society, China is now the third most visited country in the world. New China, bold and forward-looking, is also interwoven with a China whose roots go back more than four millennia. It has endured as a single nation for more than 2,000 years. How could a large and diverse country remain unified for so long? And who created it? Ancient texts described a first emperor who initiated the nation's long series of ruling dynasties. But there were almost no surviving artifacts from that era to study. His name was Ying Zhang. Originally, he was the leader of a region called Qin, one of China's seven states at the time. The states had been at war for more than 200 years. By the time the young king was 29, in the year 230 BC, he unleashed a campaign to dominate all of his enemy states and end the centuries of war. History mentioned the emperor's wartime exploits, but there were many facts about him that remained hidden for more than 2,000 years. But in 1974, that all changed. A long drought had parched the central province of Shangji. Grain was dying in fields. Local villagers decided to dig a well. What they discovered would change the course of history. The villagers wondered if it could be the head of a Buddha, or would they be punished for taking it? Or was it a relic they could sell at the marketplace. After this first find, farmers discovered more clay fragments as well as bronze arrowheads. Months later, archaeologists arrived. Their leader was Yuan Zhongyi. I didn't expect anything major. I thought I would be there a week, but that week turned into months. We started to find more and more of these clay statues. The condition and the nature of the clay pieces suggested they were extremely old. We had never seen anything like this. Pieced together, the broken shards formed a life-size Asian warrior. Come 
Then another, and another. We were looking at faces from the deep past. Why were these objects made? Why was there nothing written about them in the ancient history scrolls? The first bronze sword unearthed at the site was miraculously untarnished. And not artwork, but an actual weapon from antiquity. It was hard to tell the age of the sword. Then, there it was. An inscription at the hilt of the sword that stated it was made for Qing Shi Huangdi, the fabled first emperor of China, more than 2,000 years ago. With great excitement, we continue to carefully dig and discover more and more of these clay figures, brown swords, and arrowheads. We found the relic site much, much larger than we had expected. It took us about half a year to find the edge of the site. Little did we know. Most 2,000 warriors and horses in a pit more than twice the size of a soccer field, far beyond anything the archaeologist had imagined. Two more pits were discovered in 1976. More warriors, horses, chariots, and bronze weapons were dug up. The third pit, the smallest, is believed to be the army headquarters, filled with terracotta generals and officers, leaders of the warriors in the other two pits. Researchers believe this pit was broken into at some point and the heads were destroyed. The soldiers are six feet tall, taller than most people of that time. Each warrior has a unique face, all hand carved by hundreds of craftsmen who imbue the faces with emotion, some happy, some sad, or angry. Captivating as the clay figures are, they were once colorful as well, painted brilliant hues to make them more lifelike. One thing that time has diminished. Imagine how they must have looked 2,000 years ago, 
before they were buried and forgotten. A formidable and resplendent army whose ancient mission remained a puzzle to the first archaeological teams. We now know that they were created at the order of the first emperor. He commanded craftsmen to fashion an immense clay army. It was an unprecedented feat, even by today's standards of mass production. Today, excavating and piecing together the thousands of clay figures is a staggering challenge. Though countless pieces have been recovered, they are a fraction of what remains buried. The original archaeologists have retired. Zhang Tianxu and Mrs. Li Xuzhen continue their work. We will be working for generations to uncover all that the first emperor buried here. Every day is filled with anticipation. Based on recent findings, we have begun a new excavation in this part of pit number two. Though smaller than the first pit, we believe it will prove to be even richer in archaeological value. This is very exciting. We believe there may be nearly a hundred war chariots hidden here and more than a hundred warriors mounted on horses, which could give us important new insights into the first emperor's military strategies. We are also hoping to find and preserve figures that still have a lot of the original painted color on them. When I say this to people from the outside world, I always get the same questions. What was the purpose of all these soldiers? Why in the world go to so much trouble? One
A triggering device made the weapons easier to hold steady and fire. Infantry and chariots were arrayed in 38 columns, backed by more columns guarding their flanks and the rear. The Qin army went largely undefeated. Ying Zhang had replaced traditional peasant armies with the first professional military in China's history. The exploits of the real Qin army led to a stunning achievement. The first ever unification of all China, celebrated by thousands who could not have imagined how long their empire would endure. Conquest of the six warring states. Ying Zheng and his Qin army controlled much of what is now modern day China. Many historians believe that the English word China comes from the word Qin. It was a vast countryside full of natural riches from Inner Mongolia to the north to the boundaries of the Yellow River to the west, east to the Yellow and East China Sea. And as far south as modern day Guangzhou. This was the land that the first emperor unified. is now 221 BC. The King of Qin, at the age of 38, has unified the nation. He gives himself a new name, Qin Shi Huangdi, literally, first emperor of the Qin. So communities across his new empire could communicate, the first emperor standardized many aspects of life. All citizens would have the same currency, weights and measures, and use the same writing system. The result? A more cohesive country, which has stood the test of time. With the various territories now unified, the emperor knew that if his new empire was to last, he had to secure its borders. The greatest threat came from the warring nomadic groups that could attack from the north. Qin Shi Huangdi began a massive construction project, rebuilding earlier defensive walls in the states he had conquered and connected them into a barrier stretching more than 3,000 miles. It cost a fortune and cost as well the lives of untold thousands of laborers. Some 1600 years after Chen Shi Mangdi, the Ming Dynasty rebuilt and expanded his long, mainly earthen barrier into the colossal stone and brick Great Wall we know today. To speed the movement of troops and supplies 
and to improve public transportation as well. The first emperor built a network of canals. Some are still used today. The Lin Chu Canal, near modern-day Guilin, connects the branches of the Yangtze River and the Pearl River. It was the first canal in the world to connect two river valleys and enabled ships to travel 1,200 miles from inland China to Hong Kong. The massive infrastructure of roads and waterways built by the emperor was one of the keys to the success of his dynasty. Soldiers, weapons, food and supplies could all be dispatched quickly to quell uprisings throughout the country. Dynasties followed him, 
Qin Shi Huangdi's vast underground tomb complex was forgotten. The mound has never been excavated. It remains one of the last great historical mysteries on Earth. The only written record of what may be inside Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb is a book written 200 years after his death. In records of the Grand Historian, Sima Qian describes the lavish interior of the mausoleum. This is what he wrote. They dug through three layers of brown water and poured in bronze for the outer coffin. Palaces and scenic towers were constructed, and the tomb was filled with rare artifacts and wonderful treasure. Mercury was used to simulate a hundred rivers, the Yangtze and Yellow River, and the Great Sea, and set the flow mechanically. Above, were representations of the heavenly constellations. Legend has it, the stars were made of precious jewels and pearls. Qin Shi Huangdi's body is said to lie on a map of the Chinese terrain he ruled over, dressed in the grandeur he hoped would follow him into the afterlife. The entire tomb complex amounts to an underground city of the dead. Not only the emperor's mound-covered tomb chamber, but an array of pits around it, including the terracotta warriors. How could this monumental complex have been forgotten for more than 2,000 years? On orders of the second emperor, the principal craftsmen who built the tomb were walled inside it so they couldn't reveal the tomb's secrets. In time, there was no one left who even knew of its existence. Though we have not yet seen inside the tomb, researchers have discovered that Chen Shi Wangdi took with him more than just an army. It appears he wanted to be entertained in the afterlife. Archaeologists have unearthed acrobats, strongmen, musicians, as well as terracotta officials and bureaucrats. They discovered a replica of the Imperial Garden with more than 45 bronze waterfowl, including ducks, geese, and cranes. People ask me, why do you spend all your effort on the pits around the emperor's tomb? Why don't you open the tomb itself? The answer is, the danger of damage to its contents is too great now. We learned a terrible lesson a few years ago. We excavated a figure with the colors still intact. When we took it outside, the paint immediately curled up and peeled off right before our eyes. In 10 minutes, the color was gone. I felt horrible, but there was nothing we could do. In the meantime, we're using remote sensing devices, such as ground penetrating radar and different kinds of tomography to get a general idea of what's down there until we can protect 100% of what lies beneath the mound. We have to wait. That is hard, considering the incredible wonders purported to be buried there. We've confirmed a large tomb complex. We also believe we have identified an underground palace. And, amazingly, above the tomb, a pyramid-like 10-story building perhaps a kind of pathway 
for the emperor's soul to leave the tomb. But until we excavate, we can't know if the fabulous things in historical texts are true. Had it not been for well diggers seeking water for their crops, countless more generations might have passed without ever glimpsing the remarkable relics the first emperor left behind. The Qin Dynasty disappeared, but advancements made by the first emperor have made possible the long survival of the country to this day. His harsh rule is well documented, but he is also the man who created a vast infrastructure of roads and canals. He secured the borders, standardized weights and measures, currency, and the writing system. Qin Shi Huangdi built the foundation of modern China. Today, his country is a dynamic blend of ancient and modern, one of the most mysterious and exciting places on the planet. China continues to honor and discover its past, while also taking its present and future place as a major world leader. First Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi searched for immortality. In Emperor Qin's own way, the relics and monumental advances he left behind ensure that his name will not be forgotten. In a sense, he found the immortality that he so desperately sought. <laughs> 